Hello everybody and welcome to the first video in our series of videos on the parliamentary tradition in Irish politics in the 19th century. Today we're going to be looking at Daniel O'Connell and the fight for emancipation. As always we begin with our learning outcomes so by the end of this presentation you guys should know what Catholic emancipation was, you guys should know what the Catholic association was, its methods and how it raised money and finally you guys should know why the water for the election in 1826 was so important. So today we will be looking at the first of our two main figures from the era uh, of the 19th century, uh, Daniel O'Connell. But before we begin looking at O'Connell and his movement for Catholic emancipation, we need to refresh ourselves on what happened in Ireland prior to his emergence on the political stage. So remember, after the 1798 uh, rebellion, the British government had passed the Act of Union, meaning that the Irish Parliament, which sat in College Green in Dublin, was to be closed, and Ireland would be ruled directly from Westminster, where the British government sat. The Act of Union was brought in because the British felt that a Protestant ascendancy, remember these were the wealthy Church of Ireland or Anglican nobles who uh, lived in Ireland and who dominated the political and social economic life in Ireland, they believed that these guys had failed in ruling the country. However, after the Act of Union, life stayed much the same for the Protestant ascendancy. Well, there, were, uh, there were some attempts at reform uh, by Robert Peel, who was the chief secretary in Ireland, which meant that he was the representative, representative of the British Parliament. Um, these reforms uh, didn't deal with the biggest political issue uh, of the time, Catholic emancipation. This was still denied to the Catholics. So remember, Catholic emancipation basically meant freeing the Catholics of Ireland from the unfair penal laws. Remember from our study of the 1798 rebellion that the penal laws were a series of discriminatory laws against Catholics and Presbyterian laws. And though many of these uh, penal laws had been removed by this point, Catholics still didn't have the right to sit in Parliament and had to pay a tithe to the Church of England or the Anglican Church. Henry Grattan, who had done so much for Catholic emancipation before 1798, died in 1820 uh, without getting these last discriminatory laws removed. So the job would fall to a successful lawyer named Daniel O'Connell. And in 1823, O'Connell uh, a Catholic himself who had been campaigning for Catholic emancipation decided to make one more effort to break the government's resistance to granting Catholic emancipation. So in 1823, he established the Catholic Association, which was set up explicitly to try to unite all the different groups seeking emancipation into one organised organisation. O'Connell had a very clear and specific idea of how he wished to achieve this goal. O'Connell was a pacifist, meaning that he didn't believe in uh, using violence to achieve his goals. O'Connell had been in France in 1793 and seen the violence that led to the execution of Louis XVI. He had seen the horrors of the 1798 rebellion from the terror of General Lake to the sectarian violence of the defenders, the People Day Boys in the Orange Order and the reprehensible massacres at Schoolabog and Wexford Bridge and he believed that violence creates more evils than the cure and leave the country worse than it was. So uh, O'Connell opened the Catholic Association to anyone who could contribute any money. He realised that people would have a stronger sense of belonging if they contributed towards it, no matter how small the amount that they actually contributed was. The Catholic priests began collecting money after Mass, and within the first year, £20,000 had been raised, which was just a huge amount of money for this time. And this money became known as the Catholic rent. Uh, the money was used to pay legal expenses. It was used to organise petitions towards governments and local governments. Um, <clears throat> it was even used to buy school books for poor children. Um, the British government was horrified by this national movement, this organised national movement, and had it banned in the spring of 1825. They also banned the Orange Order, um, just so that it wouldn't appear that it, it, it was a biased act. Um, O'Connell 
who refused to break the law in pursuit of his goal, founded a new Catholic association uh, that was within the provisions of the law. When there was an election called in 1826, uh, the Catholic Association attempted to try to get a supporter of Catholic emancipation elected. This was no easy task. It was made even harder by the fact that uh, many only people with farms worth more than 40 shillings could vote. These were known as the 40 shilling uh, holders. And there was no such thing as secret ballots. This meant that if you voted against the local Protestant landlord, who was the usual candidate for Westminster, he would know and would evict the tenant farmer. However, with the support of O'Connell, Henry Villiers Stewart, a pro-Catholic emancipation candidate, was elected in Waterford over the wealthy landlord, George Beresford. Other pro-Catholic uh, emancipation candidates won the elections in Monaghan, Louth and Westmead. Now, tenant farmers were evicted for their votes um, but O'Connell and the Catholic Association used that Catholic rent that they had been collected to help those farmers evicted. This was a giant step towards Catholic emancipation and we will look at how Catholic emancipation was achieved in the next video. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. So by now you guys should know what Catholic emancipation was. You guys should know what the Catholic Association was, its methods and how it raised money. And finally, you guys should know why the Waterford election in 1826 was so important. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys got something good from this video.